For most of my life, I had no control over my emotions. My emotions instead were controlling me. If I didn't feel motivated to work, I simply couldn't work or would really struggle to. If a family member or a loved one or a girlfriend said something deeply upsetting to me, <laughs> there was a good chance that I was going to lash out and say something that I would later go on to regret. Right? If I was feeling heartbroken or lonely, I would be just this walking shell of myself, right? Incapable of really doing anything. I'd be living in this state of just brokenness and trying to fill the void with external pleasures and things like that. And if you're a man watching this, I can almost guarantee that your inability to be stoic and maintain your composure across different situations in your life is one of the main reasons why you aren't where you want to be in life right now. And look, I'm far from perfect and I'm far from having mastered this, but just becoming a little bit more stoic in my life has taken me essentially from being a completely emotional, directionless and confused kid, right, to now being in the best shape of my life so far. In the last few years, attracting really good and high quality people and, and women, right, and also having much more success, making more money in my business, right? So there's really no telling what fixing this thing and, and becoming more stoic could actually do for you and for your life. So I'll tell you a quick story, right? Just to drive home how bad I really used to be at this, right? So I had an ex-girlfriend who used to have a tendency to kind of drift off a little bit mentally during conversations. And so what that meant is that sometimes I would say something and then she would ask a question and I would say, well, well I just, I just mentioned that. Like I just answered that. And she would be like, oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you, could you repeat it? Or I'd, I'd say, I'd say something that was a, an expression of how I was feeling and it was really difficult to say. And immediately after she went, she would say something like, sorry, say that again. <laughs> and I'd be like, hang on, I just took like, like two minutes to like pour out exactly what I'm thinking. Now I have to like go through that whole process again. And so this was difficult for me because I'm someone who particularly does not like to repeat myself, right? So you can see where this is a little bit of a, a problem, right? And so what ended up happening way too frequently is, <laughs> is I would say something, it would get missed. And I would say, no, look, I just, I just said this. And then I would be forced to repeat myself. And in, in that moment, I would get really irritated. And as a consequence, I would end up being quite rude. Like my, my facial expressions would change. My tone of voice would change. It would become very harsh and I would, I would essentially just be a pretty rude person and, and not really pleasant to talk to at all. Okay. And, and that would happen like pretty fast, like, and, and then the conversation would end up becoming about that, right? Because I would say something completely out of turn, right? That was rude, maybe uncalled for. And then obviously she would focus on that and we'd be like, Oh wait, well, why, why are you saying this to me now? And then the conversation would shift away from the important topic that it was on to <laughs> basically an argument about how we're talking to each other, right? And so not only does that waste a bunch of time, but this was a, a repeated example for me in my case of how it was really just my inability to control my emotions that led to this outcome. Like that conversation could have gone so much faster and so much better if I just was able to maintain my composure and hold it together, right? So this is an interesting question to ask yourself. Right, which is like, how many times did a conversation with a family member or a loved one end badly or, or just go badly in general for much longer than, than it needed to simply because of your inability to control your emotions? Like, like, just think about that question for a little while. How many things, how many of those conversations ended like that when they didn't have to? And look, it's not just about improving the quality of your relationships, right? But just think about your work as well, whatever that might be, right? Your business, your career, whatever is meaningful to you, whatever thing that you spend the most time on, how often does something happen in that area of your life, your work, that is unexpected, that sucks, that is difficult, that is painful, and it completely dysregulates you, right? Like it can pretty much ruin your day or at least a good chunk of your day and ruin your productivity. Right? Like your ability to work is affected by your, again, your inability to be in control of your emotions, right? Something bad happens in your business, right? You run into some kind of problem, you know, maybe you're, you're searching for leads or you're, you're talking to leads and all of them are telling you to fuck off or whatever. And, and then you just stop, right? You stop 
outreach for the day. You stop reaching out to other businesses because you're like, oh, you know what? I've been told to fuck up so many times. Like, oh, these people don't even like want my service or whatever. Something like that just comes down to your ability to tolerate that pain and regulate your emotions in that process. All right, so I need you to lock in right now, right? Don't get distracted, okay? Because we're just about to go over three components to becoming a more stoic and composed man that are gonna be crucial for you to take away from this video, okay? So the first of which, which we've already kind of touched on is emotional regulation, okay? Second is accountability, and the third is perspective. So the first misconception I wanna dispel quickly is that being a stoic man is not about not feeling emotions, Okay, because you're not a fucking cyborg, right? And it's also not about suppressing emotions. Okay, this is these are kind of the normal attacks that get levied at, I don't know, men who are particularly stoic, um, especially from women who want to see more emotion from you, right? So it's not about the fact that you're not going to feel the feelings, right? So if you're, if you're going into this with this kind of expectation, like you're not going to feel pain, you're not going to feel sorrow, anguish, anger, all these things, you are still going to feel them, okay? So that's one. And then two, it's not about suppression as well. So it's not like you're going to feel these things and then just push them down. Okay, what we want to achieve is regulation. Okay, so emotional regulation needs to be distinguished in your head from emotional suppression. So emotional regulation is about reducing the magnitude of effect that your emotions have on your mood and your behaviors, right? So reducing that magnitude and also reducing or shortening the half-life, right? The, the, the time that that emotion stays alive and relevant in your brain, reducing that half-life as much as possible, right? Shortening it. Okay, so it's about, again, reducing the magnitude and the half-life of that emotion. So what this looks like in practice, if you're sort of unskilled at this, is that one or two things can happen that completely just ruin your mood, right? Put you in a horrible mood. It can be the start of your day. Maybe your coffee machine isn't working, right? First thing in the morning, you're trying to get your coffee. It's not working you're pissed about it, right? Straight away, it puts you in this foul mood where you now talk to people in a different way and you're just a different person, right? So that's issues with the magnitude scale of things, right? One thing can happen and that's it, right? You, you've lost control. And then if you have issues with half-life, it's that a bad thing can happen and maybe, okay, maybe it doesn't ruin your mood like completely, but it just sits in your brain for way too long. Something, Someone said something to you that was particularly nasty or backhanded or passive aggressive. And you that event happens once in reality. And then you replay it like dozens of times in your head after that. You keep replaying it and you keep that thought pattern and those negative emotions active for way longer than was necessary right? It only happened one time, but the entire time you're manufacturing that pain and that negative emotion in yourself, that's when you have issues with half-life. Being a stoic man who can regulate his emotions is about feeling the emotion and then being in control of your response to that emotion, right? Being in control of the effect that that emotion has on your actual behaviors and actions in the world, right? As opposed to just living out your conditioned responses to that emotion, right? Your reflexive responses, which could be just suppressing it, right? And pushing it down inside. Or it could be just, you know, expressing that emotion and lashing it out, right? So those are reflexive. And so your ability to be stoic and what regulating your emotion comes down to is actually choosing your response. And so Viktor Frankl has a great quote that sort of fits in here, which is, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our power to choose our response. And that's where emotional regulation comes from. And so every time you think about emotional regulation, I want you to think through this three stages, three evolutionary stages of responses that you can have, okay? So stage one, right? The most unevolved stage is suppression, okay? Suppression is stage one. Stage two is unregulated expression. And stage three is release or regulated expression, okay? So I'll walk you through an example, okay? Let's say you said something to me that is actually deeply upsetting to me, right? I, I really don't like it. It really messes me up, okay? So suppression would look something like this. You say it and I go, hmm, yeah, okay, right? And I just internalize it, right? And I just build up resentment for you, okay? So the pros of that are that you don't get any backlash, right? So I don't lash out at you. And so I don't have to deal with conflict. Now, the cons of that 
is that I build up resentment and eventually that's going to result in potentially a worse conflict in the future. Okay. So, and then stage two, which is unregulated expression would be you say something to me that again, deeply obsessed me. And then I lash out back at you and I go, oh, well, I said this, well, you did this and da, 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 right. And I start going off at you. So the pros of that is that I don't hold any resentment because I get to just express everything that I feel right now in this moment. And so I get to walk away knowing that I said everything that I want to say, but the cons are that that potentially is going to have effects on our relationship, right? Because I don't know, I might've said something that is particularly nasty to you. Okay. So that's stage two, which is, I guess in, in some way in, in the evolution, it's a little bit better in some ways than stage one, because at least you're expressing it, but that's not regulated expression, right? You, you're still lashing out at a person. Okay. So stage three of evolution, which is the highest stage you can reach in this is either release or regulated expression. So what's that, what that's going to look like in practice is again, you say something upsetting to me and I say to you, you know, I, I, I would really appreciate if you didn't speak to me like that. Like that's a regulated response, right? I'm not lashing out at you, but I'm telling you that, look, what you have said, actually, like I've noticed that that stirs up some anger in me and I would really appreciate if you do not talk to me like that. I don't respond well to that. Please, could you talk to me like this instead? Right? <laughs> that's a regulated response. So I'm, I'm, I, I get the pros where, look, I'm telling you, like, I'm not cool with this. And I, and I don't get any, I don't build up resentment for you because I've spoken my mind. But I've done so in a way that is actually conducive to the discussion, right? And that I don't, I'm not lashing out at you. Right? I've not done anything wrong to you. <laughs> I've just told you how I feel, but in a way that's actually constructive. And the other option of stage three in the evolution is just release, right? And that's just letting go of whatever <laughs> is going on in the situation that's disturbing you, right? And so this is a matter of picking your battles, right? Like, if the coffee machine isn't working in the morning, right, or your, your cat accidentally scratches you or something, like some things need to just be let go of. And so you have to be able to, this is a, a matter of regulating your emotions, right? You have to be able to look at that and go, huh, that really ticked me off. <laughs> but is that worth being upset about right now? Not particularly. Okay, cool. I can let it go. And that's actually an option that a lot of people aren't aware is actually an option available to them, right? Because they just get trapped in, in living out the entire half-life of that emotion. As long as it wants to play with them and toy with them, it will just have its way. And then when that emotion is done with you, it leaves you and then that's it. And then you're free of it. But you do have a choice, right? Throughout that entire time that that emotion possesses you and, and influences your behavior and your actions and your state of mind, at every point in time in that half-life, you have a choice to simply drop that emotion and go, hey, this is not worth it. So that's release. And that's also at stage three of this evolution of responses that you could have. So that brings us to the next two components of being a stoic man, which are perspective and accountability. And I'm gonna talk about these two things together because they are quite inextricably linked, right? So imagine that I give you the same stimulus, right? Going back to the stimulus response equation, the same exact stimulus, let's say you have a pain in your shoulder, okay? Now, take a person who the pain in that shoulder, they've just found out, they went to a doctor, they went and got it checked, and they just found out that they have a rare case of shoulder cancer, okay? Which doesn't exist, but let's just say that it does, okay? And they have six months left to live. That same stimulus, right? And the way that they perceive that pain is going to be, wow, every time I feel that pain, I'm reminded that I have six months left to live. That's brutal. That's agony, okay? Now, let's take that exact same pain, the exact stimulus, right? It's maybe a sharp pain in your shoulder. And then instead of the person who, you know, has the shoulder cancer, it's a person who wakes up and he feels that pain and he remembers, oh yeah, yesterday I hit a really good shoulder workout. Wow, I absolutely killed it in the gym yesterday. That's, I'm in like, I'm in this much pain. Wow, you know, I did a great job yesterday. Okay. It's the same stimulus, the, the feeling, the, the, the physiological sensation is exactly the same, but because the, the mental perception of that pain is different for both of those parties, their reality that they experience, the, 
the, the texture of their experience and their mind is entirely different, right? The actual quality of your life's experience is entirely dependent on your mind and the way that you perceive that stimulus, right? So look, like, think about these two people and how differently their lives are going to be, how, how differently their lives are going to be lived out, right? One of them, every single time he feels the pain, he's reminded he has six months left to live. That's brutal, right? And so he's going to be in so much suffering in his own mind compared to the guy who with the same, same pain, he remembers that he's, he's growing his muscles and he's improving, right? So like, I just, I use this example to illustrate how, how crucial your perception of things is to your experience of them. So if so much of your experience of reality is dependent upon your perception of reality, then you need accountability, right? So that you can choose what your perception is going to be. You have to first accept and acknowledge that it is your choice. It is your choice how you perceive things. Right. And, and because what's the alternative? <laughs> what you can't choose. Oh, you know, this thing happened to me. Oh, this person said this thing. Well, and that's why I'm upset. And that's why I'm angry. And that's just the way that it is. It's them. That's the alternative. Okay. Like have it your way. Right. Then your experience of reality is dependent on factors outside of your control and you're the victim. And that's all like, do you want that? Do, is that what you want to hear? Right? Of course not, right? You want to know that instead of having your fingers pointing outwards, they can all just point inwards and you can realize that it is all your choice. How much mental suffering you go through is your choice because it is all ultimately self-manufactured. You create it because you choose that mode of being and you choose that perception, right? And so Marcus Aurelius has a great quote that fits in here as well, really well, uh, from Meditations, which is a book, by the way, that I would highly recommend that everybody reads. And it's choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel harmed and you haven't been. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's that simple. And so if you accept that the buck stops with you, ultimately, then that gives you the power to choose your perceptions and therefore choose your experience of reality, right? So let's say something like starting YouTube, right? If I sat here with the perception of, oh, you know, well, if, you know, I, I start putting, posting myself online, posting content, whatever, you know, friends and, and, and people who once knew me are going to, are going to start judging me, you know, and then, <laughs> and then what, that's going to have some kind of adverse effects on my, what, like, social perception of people's social perception of me and my reputation all that. like okay so i can choose that perception and that will stop me from ever posting anything online like this right like this youtube channel okay or i can choose the perception of look in three generations time me and everybody else who i know and who knows me are all going to be dead <laughs> right including all those people whose opinions are stopping me from doing what I really want to do, which is this YouTube channel, for example, All right? So <laughs> that's, that's my choice. And that's powerful to be able to choose that perception and go, look, hey, you know what? We're all going to be dead <laughs> in three generations time, including all these people who, whose opinions I'm somehow worried about. So ultimately it doesn't matter, right? And I'm going to do what I want to do. That's powerful. So if you can learn to regulate your emotions, right? Hold yourself accountable and adopt useful perspectives, then maybe you have a shot at actually being a stoic man, right? And, and keeping your composure. And maybe the next time you run into a problem in your business, right? <laughs> or your life, right? You can adopt the perspective of, okay, you know what? Problems are a feature of life and not a bug. Or they're a feature of business and not a bug, right? You can adopt that perspective. Maybe the next time your, your family member blows up at you unnecessarily for something, instead of adopting the perspective of, oh, you know, what, what, why does this keep happening? Oh, this is so, so frustrating. Oh, it's like, you know, like, like everything sucks, right? Maybe you could adopt the perspective of this gives me an opportunity to practice the virtue of grace. 
Maybe someone treating me that way and blowing up at me is an opportunity for me to practice a virtue. Isn't that, isn't that such a powerful perspective? And won't that, won't holding that frame and operating from that place be so much better for your experience of life? That's something to think about. I'll leave you with a quote now from Epictetus, who was a famous Stoic like Marcus Aurelius, who we mentioned earlier. And that quote is, circumstances do not make the man. They only reveal him to himself. The next time you find yourself in a particularly shitty circumstance, maybe you could ask yourself what that reveals to you about yourself. Hope this video served you, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.